All right, we are in Mark 10, and uh, I would dare say that uh, in a Church of Christ audience, Mark 10, uh, these first 12 verses will far and away be the most controversial in Mark. Now, if you're talking about audiences outside of the church, you know, probably the greatest controversy will come in, in Mark 16. Um, and, and not that in the church, with what we'll say, there won't be some controversy in Mark 16 as well. But Mark, Mark 10 has really, um, uh, I guess, been the center of a firestorm in churches of Christ. Because here we have a part of Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage. So um, let's read the text in full, and then we'll go back and uh, read each verse and make comments. All right, so Mark 10... We'll read verses 1 to 12. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So now let's, let's look at verse 1, and, and again I'll read verse 1. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Judea, across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. So notice, um, Jesus is in transit. And, and by the way, he's not going to go to Galilee again prior to his crucifixion. Now, of course, after his resurrection, he'll meet the disciples in Galilee. But uh, now, if you're mapping this out, this is occurring just a few months at the most before Jesus' crucifixion. So, so these are uh, the last days of Jesus on earth. And the region of Judea across from the Jordan was not what we think of as Judea proper. Right? So in Jesus' day, uh, the, the Palestine uh, was made up of, of three uh, regions. Right? You had Syria to the north, but then you go down south and you have Galilee, and that's where most of Jesus' ministry was. You know, uh, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. The center of his earthly ministry was Capernaum, and both of those towns were in Galilee. Then you go a little farther south, and you've got Samaria. And, of course, that's where, um, from the Jewish perspective, the half-breed Samaritans lived. And then you go farther south, and you've got uh, Judea. Right, so the province of Judea. And so, you know, during Jesus' ministry, Judea was ruled by a Roman governor, you know, by the name of Pontius Pilate. Right, but, but where Jesus is now, the region of Judea across the Jordan, it's an area that was known as Perea. Right, and so, so Perea was this, um, this region that would be south of the Decapolis. You remember we read about Jesus, uh, you know, healing the demonized man in Gadara, well, that was in the region of the Decapolis. So, so now he's south of that, and this, this region south of the Decapolis, these ten, this ten-city federation, but north of Moabite territory, that was the region of Perea. And by the way, Perea was ruled by one of Herod the Great's sons. You know, at Herod's death... Um, his kingdom was split up between a few of his sons. Archelaus got uh, Judea and Samaria. Um, Herod Philip got Ichiri and Trachonitis. And then Herod Antipas got Galilee and Perea. So this is an area that's ruled 
by Herod Antipas. Um, maybe a lot of information, but that was confusing. Just, just let me know. So, so he's making his way toward Jerusalem. All right, so he's crossed over the Jordan, making his way toward Jerusalem. And, and Jesus uh, teaches this crowd. We're told that he taught as his custom was. Now, this teaching, uh, you find a parallel in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, you find Matthew's parallel. And Matthew tells us, we won't take the time to read the verse, but Matthew 19, 2 tells that Jesus didn't just teach the people, but Jesus also healed those who had need of being healed. All right, so verse 2 of uh, Mark 10. We're told some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, the first thing that strikes us when we read that is Jesus is confronted again by Pharisees. And as far as Mark's gospel account is concerned, he's not had to deal with the Pharisees since chapter 7. Remember back in chapter 7, uh, the Pharisees criticized Jesus' disciples for not washing their hands before they ate. And Jesus had that controversy. And then that started this pretty long section of Scripture where Jesus... Uh, ministered outside of Galilee, outside of these regions in which Jews primarily lived. He went into, into uh, uh, you know, primarily Gentile territories, which Galilee was also called Galilee of the Gentiles. So Galilee had a higher percentage of Gentile population than what Judea did. But, but at any rate, he, he leaves this uh, Jewish territory after that controversy with the Pharisees. So they've not bothered him since chapter 7. But now again, here they come. And they're troubling Jesus. And, and when it says that they come and they test him by asking, uh, you know, keep in mind, they're, they're trying to get him to say something that, that they can use against him. Like we're going to see Jesus being tested uh, again. Look at chapter 12 of Mark. Chapter 12. Look at verse 13. The Pharisees are going to test him again here in, in Mark 12, verse 13. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus, and note this, to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? Why are you testing me? There's our word uh, that we find here. So, so they don't have righteous motives when they ask Jesus this question about divorce. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They're trying to trap him. And you remember that uh, John the Baptist got in some trouble you know, on the whole marriage question back in chapter 6. Look at Mark chapter 6. So in, in, in Mark's account, uh, we're told who various groups of people are supposing that Jesus is. And, um, you know, Herod Antipas, the one who rules Galilee and Perea, thinks, well, he must be John the Baptist, raised from the dead. I beheaded him. And then we've got the story of how John the Baptist lost his head. So verse 17 says, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he bound him and put him in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now, by the way, this is not the Philip who ruled uh, the territory to the north and east of Galilee and Perea. It, it's not the, the Herod Philip who ruled Itchery and Trachonite. It's actually Herod the Great had a couple of sons named Philip. And so, so this, this Philip was a, a private citizen. But anyway, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, by the way, and we dealt with this in the Mark video, the primary issue with Herod being married to Herodias was not necessarily divorce. Not that that was good, that was bad. That was sin, but the primary issue with Herod's marriage to Herodias was that it was incest. The law of Moses forbade someone from marrying his brother's wife while his brother was still alive. 
And that was the primary issue there because, you know, notice in the language, um, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Leviticus 18, 16 forbade that. But, but at any rate, you know, where marriages were touched on, you know, that resulted in, in John the Baptist's death. So, you know, the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus in trouble on uh, divorce and remarriage. So, whenever uh, Mark uh, states the Pharisees' question, uh, you know, with these words, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Mark 10 to understand what's meant by lawful. The question is, is it lawful according to the law of Moses? Now, I think here it would be helpful for us to turn back to Matthew and read Matthew's parallel account because Matthew gives us a detail that will help us understand really the nature of the question. Right? So the question is not, does the law of Moses allow divorce? The, the law of Moses assumed that divorces would occur. And there are just lots of different passages that we could turn to where uh, divorce is not regulated per se, but which just assumes that divorce occurs. So the question is not, is, is divorce ever legitimate? Rather, the question is, in what circumstances is divorce allowed by the law of Moses? And that's clear from Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. Matthew 19, 3. So some Pharisees came to him, came to Jesus to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now note these next words, for any and every reason. That was the subject of debate in Jesus' day. Did the law of Moses teach the any cause divorce? So, so the key words in the NIV translation is, for any and every reason, is the any cause divorce uh, lawful according to the Old Testament? All right, so here the debate centers around Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. But before we turn there, any comments or questions about what we've said so far? <clears throat> and I did make the font bigger on the handouts. I know we've gone to two pages, but I couldn't read <laughs> <laughs> the font, the way I had it, so I had to get bigger. All right, well, let's turn over to Deuteronomy 24. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 24, and I'm just going to read verses 1 to 4, and then we'll notice, you know, where the controversy with Deuteronomy 24 really centers. So Moses writes, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, literally hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So the debate over whether or not the law of Moses just or, or uh, countenance divorce for any and every cause, centers around those words in the NIV translation, verse 1, something indecent. Something indecent. What is the meaning of something indecent? Now, by the way, before we uh, you know, go further and, and consider that, that debate anymore, let me just say that, that this is one passage that uh, modern translations like the NIV are far superior to translations like the King James. Because the way the King James translates Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4, it makes it appear like there's just a whole series of laws that, that Moses gives here. When in reality, what you've got is, is this, this case law. Moses uh, paints this uh, particular scenario. 
And the real law of Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4 comes at the end. And the, the real law of this passage is in verse 4, Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she's been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. That would bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an, as an inheritance. So it presents this scenario. If this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens, then her first husband who married her is not allowed to marry her again after she's defiled, that would bring sin upon the land. So, so that is the real point of the passage, okay? But in spite of the fact that, that that's the real point of the passage, and it, and it really doesn't seem like Deuteronomy 24 is intended to really give grounds for divorce, in spite of that, you've got this debate that rages over what the meaning of something indecent is. And... Uh, and let me just give you my two cents while we're here before we notice the debate. Um, and, you know, my position on Deuteronomy 24 is pretty well the standard position. So, so something indecent, that is a, an unusual phrase in the Old Testament. It actually occurs only in one other place, that is that phrase in particular, and that is in the previous chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 14. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> sorry, I have trouble not chuckling a little bit because uh, I think one of the most comical passages, and I know it's not meant to be comical, but one of the most comical passages is in Deuteronomy 23 verses 12 to 14 when it's translated in a literal way. Because this, you know, in order to keep uh, uncleanness out of the camp, the Lord says when, you know, when Israelites go to war, you know, they need to have a place where they go and relieve themselves. And a part of their equipment needs to be, you know, a shovel, something to cover it up with so that you don't, you know, go to the bathroom in the camp and bring uncleanness on the camp. And so you go to this place outside and then you cover it up. And then after giving this instructions, you know, that, that you have this place outside the camp to relieve yourself and you cover it up, then verse 14, the NIV says, for the Lord your God moves about in your camp. Literally, it's for the Lord your God walks about in your camp. So God doesn't want to step in it. You know, so I've just always found that quite a, quite a comical. Anyway, I don't, and I don't mean that in an irreverent way. But at any rate, so, so verse 14 says, for the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you. Now note this, anything indecent and turn away from you. There's the phrase, anything indecent. Same thing there that you find in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. So, so what is this something indecent? Well, you have all sorts of ideas, but you know, I would just say that it's got to be something less serious than adultery. And why would I say it has to be something less serious than adultery? Well, because turn back to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. And look at verse 22. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, so that's adultery, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge evil from Israel. So under the Old Testament law, the penalty for adultery was execution. And so it sure doesn't seem like something indecent in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 would be adultery. Since two chapters before, execution is commanded for the adulterer and the adulteress. So this is something less serious. So, so here, if a man doesn't like his wife, she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent in her. And he writes her this certificate of divorce. And she leaves his house. And she goes out and she marries another man. Uh, it's interesting, verse 4 would seem to indicate that she becomes defiled in that remarriage. Because look at verse 4. Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. And that, that's a reference seemingly to her second marriage. 
So the something indecent is something less serious than adultery. Okay? Now, we can talk about that more and the implications of it when we get to our comments on uh, verses 10 through 12, or 11 and 12 of Mark 10. But let's, let's notice what the controversy was in Jesus' day. Okay, so on your outline, under the reference to Deuteronomy 24, I've got a quotation from the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is um, a piece of Jewish literature. It was written about A.D. 200, so 200 years after Jesus was born, the Mishnah is written. But the Mishnah, though not written until A.D. 200, it's based upon these oral traditions that go back to the time of Jesus. So whenever the Pharisees asked Jesus, uh, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every cause, what is written here in Mishnah Gittin, this is the controversy that they're trying to get Jesus to weigh in on. This is the trap that they're setting for him. Okay, So the Mishnah, it is a hard read. I mean, you can't... It, the person who could just sit down and read it from beginning to end, I mean, they deserve some special award. Because basically what it does is it just, it just goes through these various laws of the Old Testament and Rabbi so-and-so says this and Rabbi such-and-such -such says that. And it can be very hard to follow. But here's, here's Mishnah Gittim. Quote, The school of Shammai, so Shammai was a rabbi, say... A man may not divorce his wife unless he has found unchastity in her, for it is written. Now, the quote from Deuteronomy 24.1, because he hath found indecency in anything. And by the way, a lot of times the argument is made, well, the school of Sham, I believe, that uh, fornication, sexual immorality, adultery, that's the only reason that they would grant a divorce. But the problem with that is the Mishnah was written in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, the phrase unchastity or indecency of anything, it's just a quotation from Deuteronomy 24. So it's really not altogether clear what their belief was from the Mishnah. But still yet, you know, preachers typically say, well, the, the school of Shammai said that, you know, divorce was only granted in the case of adultery. Well, maybe, maybe not. You really can't know that from just what's written in the Mishnah. And, and by the way, uh, looking at Josephus, that, I didn't find that helpful either. Now, another rabbi. And the school of Hillel say, he may divorce her even if she spoiled a dish for him, for it is written, and now Deuteronomy 24, because he hath found in her indecency in anything. Now, he's got a third rabbi. Rabbi Akiba says, even if he hath found another fairer than she. Now that's pretty loose grounds. For it is written, and it shall be, and it shall be if he find no favor in his eyes. So here's the thing. Here's the debate with Deuteronomy 24. The school of Shammai viewed that phrase something indecent as referring to one thing. The school of Hillai, Hillel, excuse, Hillai, Hillel argued that there were two things. That they argued that there was indecency. That's one thing, and then something or matter, any other matter. So, so they would argue that there were two causes there. So, so, so Jesus, uh, you know, where do you, uh, what's your ruling on this matter? All right, so any, any comments on that? Any questions about the debate? So the debate itself was, did you, uh, this is where I No, it's in reference to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, the phrase, something indecent. Or, you know, if you throw in Rabbi uh, Akiba in the, in the mix, the question is, uh, becomes displeasing to him because he's found something indecent about her. So, so it's, that, it's that phrase. And then these different schools, Shammai, Hillel, Akiba, they have different positions as to what it means. So the debate is among them over what the meaning of Deuteronomy 24 is. And so, so you've got the school of Hillel who argues that it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause under the law of Moses. Other comments? All right, well, let's, uh, let's go back to Mark. So Jesus, now... 
you're going to find Matthew's presentation of the material in a different order than Mark's. But, uh, but Mark records Jesus as answering their question with these words. What did Moses command you? He replied. Well, <laughs> well, that's the debate. What did Moses command? You know, but Jesus, you know, so often, uh, you know, replied to a question by asking a question. And I, I supplied another example in Mark's gospel, and you find it also in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus answered a question by asking a question. Now, um, if you look at Matthew's account, Right, so in Matthew's account, Jesus replies to the Pharisees' question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every cause? He replies by asking a question, have you not read? And then in Matthew's account, Jesus puts together Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24 and says, you know, since a, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh, then what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. They're not two, they're one flesh. No, it's not lawful for a man to divorce his wife for every cause. And then they say in reply, Matthew 19, 7, well, why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? So in, in Matthew's account, it's, it's the Pharisees who, who bring up you know, this question, why did Moses command it? But here in Mark, Jesus asks, well, what did Moses command you? And, and here's their reply, verse 4 of Mark 10. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And again, while you know, Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4 has you know, only that one command that's found in verse 4, the first husband can't take back the wife he's divorced after she's married another man. You know, that's the one law. There seems to be this implied law that if a man is going to divorce his wife, then he does need to give her a certificate of divorce. Because that then freed her up to then, you know, go and marry another man. All right, verse 5. So Jesus replies to their, uh, you know, explanation of Moses' teaching, verse 5, by saying, It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. Now that word that's translated hardness of heart, it only occurs three times in the Greek New Testament. And two of those times are in you know, Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage. You know, Matthew 19, here in Mark chapter 10. And the third occurrence is in Mark chapter 16. Look at its occurrence in Mark 16. <clears throat> and when we get to... Mark 16, we'll discuss the question as to whether or not verses 9 through 20 actually were written by Mark or whether or not uh, they were supplied by a later copyist because he thought that there was some deficiency in Mark uh, with Mark ending in verse 8 or, or the various explanations. But for now, we'll just assume uh, Mark 16, 9 to 20 is a part of Mark's text. So verse 14 of Mark 16 says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. So this is after his resurrection. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he rose from the dead. So in the Greek text, he rebuked them for their hardness of heart. Their stubborn refusal to believe in the Greek text is their hardness of heart. Right, so, so hardness of heart... Uh, you know, it's, it's not a problem with your cholesterol or anything like that. Hardness of heart is a spiritual problem, and hardness of heart is what leads to a rebellion against God, a rebellion to do what God has said, a rebellion to believe what God has said. So, so Jesus said the reason why Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4 is in the Old Testament is because God knew how sinful a people you were. God knew that there would be marriage problems among you. And so God set out to regulate uh, divorce. And seemingly the thought, you know, lots of different explanations have been given for the teaching of Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 to 4. You know, why would, would God through Moses forbid a man from taking back his first wife after he's divorced her and she's remarried another man? 
Why would he do that? And, and perhaps one reason is to, uh, you know, slow down the whole divorce process, you know? It, it, lots of different explanations have been given. Explanations have been given to keep, you know, the man from taking advantage of her, for getting, you know, a, 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 the bride price. Again. You know, lots of different explanations have been given. But, but at any rate... Um, it seems like whatever reason it was it was for a protection uh you know relative to to marriage that that Moses gave that uh prohibition but divorce and remarriage Deuteronomy 24 is allowed under the law of Moses because of their hardness of heart there's this tendency and we all know it for marriage problems to arise because people are sinful you know uh Charity and I have had a few fights in our years. Not a lot, but we've had a few fights. And I can tell you why we've had the fights we've had. Because I have a hard heart. <laughs> That's it. it. It's because I'm a sinner. And, you know, she has sinned occasionally, but not as much as me. You know, all marriage problems come from the fact that we're sinners. In fact, all of our relationship problems come from the fact that we're sinners. Okay, uh... Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I understood, but did you say that the, uh, the law to keep her from uh, marrying her first husband was for her protection? Well, so, so basically the text doesn't say. The text doesn't give a reason why. And so people have uh, suggested any number of reasons why, yeah, right? Yeah, well, so, so uh, I'm trying to remember the way that it was explained in one commentary. Um, as a means of keeping him from, don't quote me on this, I'll have, to, I'll have to look and read that explanation again. As a means to keep him from divorcing her, uh, just so, in a sense, he could double dip financially, I have to go back and, and read that and, and reread that explanation, right? Whatever the explanation is, there's assumption involved in it. So, you know, your guess is as good as mine. A scholar's guess is as good as ours, right? So, can't help you anymore with that. Can you remember, David? Uh, I can't. Um, you, you remember reading some of those explanations? Yeah, at various points. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, Sorry. Yeah, that's that's what we're talking, you know, financially benefiting, the husband benefiting from it. You know, the husband the husband had to pay uh the bride price to the father and then and then she came into the marriage with a dowry and uh you know, those those laws, I mean, you can read it in a Bible dictionary the various explanations for the marriage laws that you know, you just kind of pick up from statements here there and everywhere in the Old Testament. You know, uh, so anyway, I'd invite anyone that's that's curious about the marriage customs uh, to do that. And I just don't remember all the details of that. So, all right, moving on to verse 6, unless there's another question. Does anybody have another question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it says that, um, that their hearts were hard is the reason that Moses wrote the law, right. was it acceptable to God? Well, so, um, you have to, and, and we'll, we'll get into this in just a moment, you have to understand that um, God has often tolerated things that were not a part of his ideal will uh, because of human sinfulness. You know, and, and an example as it relates to marriage is polygamy. You know, I'm going to argue here in just a minute that polygamy was not a part of God's uh, you know, ideal will for marriage. Right? He did not create multiple wives for Adam. He created one wife for Adam. Um, but, of course, polygamy was something that, you know, with the fall, uh, was it Lamech? The first polygamist you read about in Genesis chapter 4, you know, polygamy began to be practiced. And, and actually, 
you know, in the Old Testament, polygamy was tolerated. Um, there actually were some laws where if followed, polygamy would result, like the Leverett Marriage Law of Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10. And actually, in uh, some Old Testament passages, I'm thinking of Ezekiel chapter 23, if memory's not failing me, God is presented as a polygamist because he's married to one wife, Judah, and he's married to another wife, Israel, at the same time. But that's not God's ideal. It's something that God, you know, held his nose and tolerated because of human sinfulness. And so, uh, with divorce and remarriage under the Old Testament law, you ask, was God okay with that? Well, God tolerated it. And, you know, a person could be faithful under the law even if uh, they divorced and remarried. Is divorce ever a part of God's ideal will for marriage? No. But it's something that God tolerated. Any other comments on that? I, I was just going to say um, um, uh, a comment was um, I was reading that uh, Moses was God's prophet and God spoke to us through his prophet. So by him writing that as a commandment, that would be God speaking to us through him. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you, you just um, <clears throat> you could just notice any number of places where uh, Moses speaks you know, God is presented as speaking, and where, you know, other prophets speak, God is presented as speaking. So, yes, absolutely. That's, that's God's voice to Israel. Yeah. I mean, just like, uh, just like in the New Testament, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I've written to you are the commands of the Lord. So, it doesn't have to be, in the New Testament, it doesn't have to be written in red for it to be Jesus' words. All of the New Testament is Jesus' words, and all of the Old Testament is Yahweh's words, in a sense. Yeah. All right, any, any comments? All right, well, time's getting away from us, but uh, let's, let's get into these next few verses. But at the beginning of creation, God, quote, now note this, this is a quote from Genesis 127, made them male and female, unquote. Two genders at creation. And then he's going to give another quote, verse 7, from Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now Jesus is going to make a, uh, an implication or, or, or uh, an inference uh, from those verses as it relates to divorce and remarriage, or as it relates to divorce. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I mean, if it's the case that the marriage relationship supersedes the, the relationship that one has with his father and mother, you leave father and mother, you cleave to his wife, and, and you know, uh, your father and your mother remain your father and mother as long as you live and they live. So that is a lasting relationship. But the marriage relationship supersedes that relationship that one has with his father or mother. Then Jesus says, that, no, you become one flesh. God does not want uh, uh, divorce to happen for any and every cause. The any cause divorce is not a legitimate. It's not a part of God's uh, ideal will. And then I've got a quote or, or a statement here on the the second page, C, the word to, you know, where Jesus in verse um, 8 quotes from Genesis 2.24, and the two will become one flesh. In the Hebrew text, there is no word to. The Hebrew text just says they will become one flesh. Now, the Greek translation of Genesis 2.24 adds the word to, and so Jesus is quoting from that Greek translation as Mark presents it. And I think that the fact that, that uh, Jesus gives legitimacy to that word too, they too shall be one flesh, that that creates a strong case for monogamy as opposed to polygamy. Uh, in the New Testament especially, monogamy is God's will. Now, you know, we could debate uh, what's the meaning for, uh, you know, the qualification for an elder, the husband of one wife. You know, was that intended to say that a polygamist is not allowed to be an elder? And 
I'll tell you, there's a strong case to be made for that. There was some polygamy among the Jews in the first century. Um, and, you know, you that's not a real big problem, you know, here in the United States. But if you go overseas, that becomes a problem. You know, some places in Africa, you, you know, you go and do mission work in some places in Africa. You know, uh, the man that used to clean the church building, Alex, he was from Nigeria. Uh, his father was a polygamist. He was the oldest son of his father's favorite wife. But what if you were to baptize his father? Would you require that his father divorce all of his wives except for his first wife? Or would you uh, allow him to remain with his wives, care for his wives, but then teach, you know, uh, people from then on out that it's not legitimate to marry multiple wives? So, you know, this becomes a live question, you know, when you do mission work in other parts of the world. All right, any comments on that? There's got to be a comment on that. Yes, ma'am. My uh, brother was a missionary in Zambia and came upon this very same thing. He baptized an old uh, chief of a tribe that had six wives. And they talked about it and discussed it. He prayed about it. The chief's thing was if he put his, if he divorced his wives, they would be ostracized and set out of the village. Mm -hmm. And women set out of the village never lived more than a, a few months. Either animal attacks or other people attacks or, or disease or starvation. And so he was, he understood what the Bible said, and my brother I said, but it talks about elders. Doesn't say everybody else. And so the, between the two of them they came up with that he should not put his wives out, but he only slept with his first wife. Mm -hmm. He took care of the other five and the children of those, but only had his kept his one wife as his wife. Right. And uh, so there are many interpretations of what you can do with this when you baptize somebody who is a uh, is a polygamist. Right, and, and I would say that uh, that that would be the least that I think would be biblically permissible. Uh, I don't know if I said that right. I would say that, 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 that he should not put his wives out. That would be the least that he should do relative to those wives that he's currently married to, from my understanding. I don't see... It would be a death Yeah, I, I don't see... And I think that it's, it's maybe possible for him to remain a polygamist under those circumstances since he's already married to them. You know, and moving forward, um, I don't think that it would be legitimate to, for a Christian individual to marry multiple wives. But when you come into the faith in that way, um, yeah, I, I don't think that putting those wives out would be the right thing to do. Now, I've never been a missionary in those parts of the world, and, you know, that's, so that's just, as far as I'm concerned, that's just, you know, um, you know, an a academic explanation. But, uh, but that, that's my understanding. No, no, I, I know, but I'm just talking about for me personally, you know, never having looked at polygamous face to face and given some advice, you know. So, yeah. All right, well, uh, so we're liable to really have fireworks next week when we talk about uh, really getting into divorce and remarriage, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs>